pray today. I really felt so much ashamed. I wished I could turn white. Cause all the white folks marched with banners came. Just at the stand, the German band. They waved their flag and played to walk them rhyme. The Scotch Brigade, each man arrayed. In new black dresses marched to old Lang Syne. Even Spaniards and Swedes, folks of all kinds and creeds, had their banner except the coot alone. Every nation can brag about some kind of a flag. Why can't we get an emblem of our own? For Ireland has our harp and chaplain. England floats her lion bolt. Even China waves a dragon. Germany and England Bonnie's got the most of the song. Turkey has her crescent blue. And what more Yankees do for the old and red and blue? Every race has a flag of the blue. He says now I suggest a flag that ought to win a prize. Just take a flannel shirt and paint it red. And draw a chicken on it with a two chicken. good eyes for eyes. And have a wave and razors round its head to make it quaint. Quaint, you've got to paint. A possum with the pork chop in his teeth to give it tone. A big hand bone. You sketch upon a banjo underneath. And be sure not to skip just a policy slip. Have it marked for 1144. Then the Marish and Dutch, they can't guy us so much. We should have had this emblem long before. Ireland has her heart in Chevron. England goes her lion bone. Even China waves a dragon. Germany and Eagle Ghost. Bonnie's got the most of the song. Turkey has her crescent blue. And what won't Yankees do for the open red and blue? Every race has a flag but the coon. It is a peculiar sensation. This double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his twoness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He would not Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He would not bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. This then is the end of his striving, to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture, to escape both death and isolation, to husband and use his best powers and his latent genius. These powers of body and mind have in the past been strangely wasted, dispersed, or forgotten. The shadow of a mighty Negro past flits through the tale of Ethiopia the shadowy and of Egypt the Sphinx, 
Through history, the powers of single black men flash here and there like falling stars and die sometimes before the world has rightly gauged their brightness. Here in America, in the few days since emancipation, the black man's turning hither and thither in hesitant and doubtful striving has often made his very strength to lose effectiveness, to seem like absence of power, like weakness. And yet it is not weakness. It is the contradiction of double aims. The double-aimed struggle of the black artisan, on the one hand, to escape white contempt for a nation of mere hewers of wood and drawers of water, and on the other hand, to plow and nail and dig for a poverty-stricken horde, could only result in making him a poor craftsman, for he had but half a heart in either cause. By the poverty and ignorance of his people, the Negro minister or doctor was tempted toward quackery and demagogy, and by the criticism of the other world toward ideals that made him ashamed of his lowly tasks. The would-be black savant was confronted by the paradox that the knowledge his people needed was a twice-told tale to his white neighbors, while the knowledge which would teach the white world was Greek to his own flesh and blood. The innate love of harmony and beauty that set the ruder souls of his people a-dancing and a-singing raised but confusion and doubt in the soul of the black artist, for the beauty revealed to him was the sole beauty of a race which his larger audience despised and he could not articulate the message of another people. This waste of double aims, this seeking to satisfy two unreconciled ideals, has wrought sad havoc with the courage and faith and deeds of 10,000 thousand people, has sent them often wooing false gods and invoking false means of salvation, and at times has even seemed about to make them ashamed of themselves. What's going on, everybody? This is Super Mike 2164. Uh, press the like, press the share, press the subscribe button. I want you to get this important message. I need your help. I really do. I need your help because I have a message that is uncompromising. So I'm going to need everyone to go ahead and share this message to their social media. And I need everyone that ever sees this message to press that like button is extremely important to me because I would like to grow my channel. So if you can help me out, go ahead and do that. So today we're going to talk about a very little known, you know, it's very well known that W.E.B. Du Bois, which is William Burkhart Du Bois, he had issues with, um, or he had a public debate with Booker T. Washington, another great black, you know, luminary, but they were actually friends because they actually traveled together, stayed with each other and did things together. There was a issue with W.E.B. Du Bois and, you know, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. There was an issue with W.E.B. Du Bois and, uh, you know, some other black people and there was debates, but you know, those are the things that we hear about today. You know, William Burkhart was his name, William Edwin Edward Burkhart Du Bois. He was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Uh, his mother was Sylvania Burkhart, and she cleaned houses. Alfred Du Bois, he was a Haitian uh, barber and laborer. Uh, du Bois, basically, you know, he, he went to school with a bunch of white people, about 4,000 white people. It was about 40 black people in that school. And he stayed black first. You know, he stayed with integrity. He was pretty much born right, you know, right, like three years after the, the official end of enslavement. So he's born in like 1868. And he lived all the way up to 1963. So he was almost 100 years old. He was 95 years old. You know what I'm saying? So about 95 years old when he passed away. So he had a long life. He was extremely smart. He had a lot of experiences. He did a lot of battles. He made a lot of battles for the black man on the intellectual front. You know, if you're looking at what's called the eugenic society. This is where we're getting into Lothrop Stoddard. 
these people are are very smart, intelligent white folks, but a lot of times they're they're not really shown prominently. And uh, this is a point in time he debated publicly in front of a bunch of black people. This uh, white he this man is a white supremacist. He literally wrote the book about. It is his book is called "The Rise in um, Tide of Color," and the rising tide of color against white world supremacy. This man, Lothrop Stoddard, this white guy, he wrote that book, and both of these men graduated Harvard, very prestigious university, so very intelligent. But till that time, just like I played in the beginning, that music, you know, they had made it routine to tease the black man, you know, publicly. It was just routine to tease, belittle our intelligence, call us coons. This was an official word. Call us uh, ignorance, you know, and basically had the entire world, you know, everybody has a flag but the coon. You see? Well, let's make them a flag. Let's uh, get a chicken and uh, draw it on there. No, 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 no. Put a coon on there with a ham bone in his teeth. These are the type of things that United States, well, you know, they would routinely, you know, make fun of black people this way. So they definitely thought we were dumber than them. And on some things, yeah, we may not have had the experience, but mentally, as far as our mental faculties, no, we are definitely not dumber. We have the capacity to to learn and to, you know, grow and do all of the things that uh, that any great people can do, even better. But let me show you guys this here. I'm going to share the screen. This here is Lothrop Stoddard. Hold on. Hold on a second here. Like I said, guys, press a a like and share. Let's go ahead and get this uh, all set up. So that's Lothrop Stoddard. You know, he likes taking this picture. This is a very prominent member of the eugenicist society and the eugenics were a whole society of people that had planned on basically genociding or reducing or eliminating the black American population because we had become useless because once they didn't have slave purposes for us, uh, they didn't know what to do with us. And so their whole objective was to eliminate us. Um, so that's what they were trying to do. So here it is in 1929. Let's look at the, uh, let's go ahead and start reading some of this here. I just want to show you some of the books that W.E.B. Du Bois wrote. Of course, The Souls of Black Folk. Let's do this. All right, so let's get, actually, you know what? That's the wrong one. We're going to get through it, guys. We're going to get through it. I just want to read this. I just want everybody to see a little bit about this debate. Let's go into it. Let's get right into it here. There it is. So that's W.E.B. Du Bois. Let's see. What books is? So here's some of the books that Lothrop Stoddard wrote. The Rising Tide of Color. Okay. Revolt Against Civilization, The Menace of the underman the menace of the underman so his books are really like all trying to get rid of black folks trying to create fear against black people the revolt against uh 
civilization. Basically, black people could not be civilized. The new world of what? Islam. Okay. Lothra Stoddard. He wrote about Islam. See, th- and, and they u- this man is prominent. They used his philosophies and they used them as guidance. The New World of Islam, guerrilla convict, okay? The French Revolution, reforging America, racial realities in Europe. Those are the type of uh, books that Lothrop Stoddard wrote. Let's see what... So W.E.B. Du Bois had an ongoing magazine called The Crisis Magazine. And he wrote those book, uh, those Crisis Magazines, you know, they were ongoing. Actually, uh, I'm going to actually try to find out the one after this debate later. But let's read a little bit about this debate. Oh, shoot. You know what? I messed up. I should have thought. Anyway, we'll find out later. So in 1929, 700 people gathered in Chicago North Hall to witness a debate on the question, should the Negro be encouraged to cultural equality? Now, isn't that what we were taught? Equality? The affirmative position was argued by W.E.B. Du Bois his opponent was Theodore Lothrop Stoddard, Harvard PhD, and author of dozens of popular articles and 22 books. During the course of the debate, Stoddard uh, summarized the conclusion to which modern science had led him. Okay, and that sounds very much like William Shockley. And I did a, I did a, a, a something on him before. He was also part of the eugenics society. So he was the next generation after this was his father. This was his parents. Okay. I summarized the conclusion to which modern science had led him. Today has never as never before. We possess a clear appreciation of racial realities. We know that our America is a white America and the overwhelming weight of both historical and scientific evidence shows that only so long as the American people remain white, will its institutions, ideals, and culture continue to fit the temperament of its inhabitants and hence continue to endure. Stoddard had excellent reason to celebrate the clarity of his perceptions and the sci- and the self-evidence of his conclusions. Quite literally, he had it on the best authority. His concept of race as a unit, un, un, excuse me, as a determining factor in human affairs was supported with virtual unanimity. Uh, unanimity Ugh, i have a problem pronouncing that by the leading figures in american social science utilizing both professional and popular channels biologists psychologists and sociologists proclaimed with one voice the inherent and immutable inferiority of the black race okay so this man and the, all of those scientists at that time. See, this is the problem with just accepting white science without dealing with it, without debating, with no questions. You know, these people, they will come up with stuff and then they will confirmation bias each other. And it'll stay that way. Okay? So that part was there. Let's look at this part. Now, this guy in the New Yorker, they had this, uh, why the gym, now, the Nazis actually used the material from Lothrop Stoddard. They actually used his material. So, and we get all of that. They actually talk about his 
predecessor, which was uh, this guy was named. Hold on a second. Grant. Madison Grant. So about 40. Okay, let me see. Now in the Bronx Zoo, about a 40 million minute walk is away from the Bronx Zoo. In 1912, it was called the New York Zoological Park. And it was run by a patrician named Madison Grant from an old New York family. Though he and Du Bois lived and worked within a few miles of each other for decades, I don't know if the two ever met. As much as anyone anyone on the planet, Grant was Du Bois' natural enemy. Grant favored a certain type of white man, which is the Nordic type. And this is what Whoopi got in trouble for. Grant favored a certain type of white man over all other kinds of humans. On a graded scale of disapproval, and he reserved his vilest ill wishes and contempt for blacks. Okay, so they definitely hate blacks worse than others, but of course they want the Nordic type white man. And this is also in this book that uh, Lothrop Stoddard wrote. As Du Bois would have remembered in 1906, the zoo put an African man named Oda Benga on display in the primate cages. So they literally put a black man on display in the primate cages. Oda Benga belonged to the tribe of pygmies whom the Belgians had slaughtered in the Congo. These people are gone, dead. Oda Benga was the last of his race, I believe, or that they knew of. And they just killed these people off. This is genocidal type people. They have no problem with genocide. Um, so... They put Oda Zingle in a primate zoo. A group of black Baptist ministers went to the mayor and demanded the travesty be stopped. Now, keep in mind, this is 1906. Black people are fighting white supremacy. Black Americans, FBA. So this is something that Africans do need to understand. Oda Benga was sitting up in jail after they had slaughtered his tribe in the Congo, black Baptist ministers went to the mayor, demanded the travesty be stopped. The mayor's office referred them to Grant, Madison Grant, which is the racist, who put them off. He said later, he later said that it was important for the zoo not to give even the appearance of having yielded to the minister's demand, okay? So that's that's the strategy for this to this day. So when we go to these white people for some sort of uh, redress of some sort of complaint, they feel that it's important for to not even give the appearance of yielding to black people's demands. Eventually, Oda Banga was moved to the Howard Colored Orphan Asylum in Brooklyn and ended up in Virginia where he shot himself. Madison Grant was someone who preferred to stay in the background and pull strings, but because of history, both past and present, he is not in the background anymore. Like other men of his social set, Teddy Roosevelt, Henry Fairfield Osborne, a president of the American Museum of Natural History, to name two, Grant adored nature, which to his milieu meant the North American continent minus its original native population and reconstituted as a hunting preserve and contemplative retreat for themselves. And that's what they're doing in Africa. And a lot of African people are allowing this, allowing white people to come in and create these nature reserves. This is what they're doing. And, oh, minus the people, get rid of those uh, Maasai, get rid of those Nihilot people, get rid of, you know, all these other people, these 
so-called humans, humanoids to them. So the passing of the great race is probably why it became one of the most famous racist books ever written. So I'm going to, I'm skipping ahead here. So yeah, the passing of the great race is probably why it became one of the most famous racist books ever written. And today it's considered part of modern genre that began with Arthur D. Gob Gobineau's The Inequality of Human Races. So these are some books that you guys probably want to, if you're looking for racism and want to research racism, keep in mind, this is at the highest levels. This is in intellectual racism. And it gives cover to all of the other things that we see, all the other branches of it. So the inequality of the human races published in 1853 to 55. Hitler read the passing of the great race. In translation, he admired what Grant had to say about the great Nordic race and wrote the offer a fan letter calling the book My Bible. So Hitler called this book his Bible, Madison Grant's book. This is an American, you know. So this is where they get this from. This is what's been done to black people for, at that time, definitely hundreds of years, okay? He also was a director of the American Eugenics Society. So Madison Grant was a director of the American New Eugenics Society. Worthless individuals should be sterilized and considered his lobbying for the Johnson Reed Immigration Act of 1924, which shut down most immigration to the U.S. to be one of the great achievements of his life. So this is something that especially black, black Africans need to understand that you know, Madison Grant lobbying for the Johnson Reed Immigration Act of 1924, which has a racial uh, integrity clause in it. That's what that that's the reason why y'all wasn't coming over here until they updated that uh, Immigration Act in 1952, and then in 1965 that eliminated that racial restriction from because of black people who lobbied for that. All the uh, civil rights uh, organizations and the black power African, pan-Africanist organizations. So let's go down. I wanna go right to the, to the debate part. All right, so the legacy of Madison Grant. Okay, so they start off with Madison Grant. Now we want to get to, in March 1929, the Chicago Forum Council, a cultural organization that included white and black members, announced the presence, the presentation of one of the greatest debates ever held. According to the forum's advertisement, the debate was to take place on Sunday, March 17th at 3 p.m. in a large hall on South Wabash Avenue. That might be the final call building, I don't know. The topic was, shall the Negro be encouraged to seek cultural equality? In smaller letters, the ad acts, has the Negro the same intellectual possibilities as other races? And below that, the answer, yes appeared with a photograph of the boys who would be arguing the affirmative alongside the answer no was a photograph of Lothar Stoddard, a writer who would argue the negative. In the picture, Stoddard projects a roguish man manti idol aura who slicked down hair and a black mustache. The ad identified him as versatile popularizer popularizer of certain theories on race problems who had been spreading alarm among white Nordics. You see, there are certain levels of white people. 
There are certain levels that they wanted. The Forum Council did not oversell its claim. The Du Bois starter debate turned out to be a singular event, as important in its way as Lincoln Douglas or Kennedy Nixon. The reason more people don't know about it may be its asymmetry. The other historic matchups featured rivals who disagreed politically but wouldn't have disputed their opponent's right to exist. Stoddard had written that mulattoes like Du Bois could not accept their inferior status, were the chief cause of racial unrest. Oh, so mulattoes like Du Bois who could not accept their inferior status were the chief cause of racial unrest in the United States, and he looked forward to their dying out. <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? That's, his, you, that's a serious life or de death debate. You don't deserve to exist. I can't wait till you die out. Du Bois' life had been chronicled definitely in David Levering's Lewis biography, and Grant now has a biographer, but nobody has written a biography of Stoddard. One does exist of Stoddard's father, John Lawson Stoddard, the world traveler who became one of the most successful public speakers of his day. Stoddard's mother divorced his father for abandonment when Stoddard was a teenager. Later, Stoddard Sr. in his villa in the Tyrol enlisted an admirer to write the story of his life. And when the biography came out, it did not mention that he had a son. The form ad got it right. Stoddard was a versatile popularizer as Huxley, as Huxley was to Darwin. So Stoddard was to Madison Grant. You can almost, but really, now, I don't feel sorry for this father-deprived young writer who found a hero in a wealthy old racist. Stoddard grew, grew up in Brookline, Massachusetts. He attended Harvard like, Stoddard before, like the Stoddard before him and got a PhD in history. In the course of 36 years, he wrote at least 18 books and countless magazines and newspaper articles. He was always, he always had to hustle. Basically, he was a freelance writer. His first book, The French Revolution in San Domingo, came out in 1914, and he dedicated it to his mother. In it, he discovered what would become his most successful writing strategies, scaring the reader with the specter of race war. The scaring the Nordic reader with the prospect of losing a race war as Stoddard interpreted what had happened to the Frenchmen in San Domingo, which was Haiti. So Lothrop Stoddard, basically, he wrote about the ha Haitian Revolution, which he called, he didn't respect the word Haiti. He called it San Domingo. And he said that if you lose a race war, look at Haiti, that's what's going to happen to you. This is what he scared. He used that event to scare the white people. They became inflamed by the French Revolution and then inflamed their fellow blacks. Okay. So basically, he blamed it on the mulattoes. He said the Stoddard said the, the villains were the mulattoes. They became inflamed by the French Revolution and then inflamed their fellow blacks. Okay. So this is another issue why in America we have that one drop rule, this mentality. So let me skip forward a little bit. I want to go straight to this debate part. All right. All right. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. The plugs must have been a few, blah, 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 blah. This guy's trying to, he, you know, he's going through the history of starter. This was the person whom Du Bois would debate and try to prove that a black person could be the equal of. Okay. So at the time of the debate, Du Bois had just turned 61. He had already written The Souls of Black Folks, one under his belt. Listen to the type of books. This man is, Lothar of Stoddard is a racist. He's concerned with race, race, race. Now, Du Bois is a race man, but 
he's the souls of black folk is is about black people explaining and teaching about you know the 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 temperament and the desires of black people to become equal in society and to elevate themselves from slavery. But this guy, and then he went to help, he helps uh, start the NAACP, even though that was started by Spengard, which is a Jewish white man. Uh, but he was trying to start an organization that would assist the black people to develop themselves. Well, Luther Stoddard is trying to create in, in part of an organization, the Eugenics Society, whose holy job is to kill the black people, all of us, okay? So these people are diametrically opposed, okay? So basically, he had started the souls, he wrote the souls of black folks. He helped found the NAACP, organized and led Pan-African conferences and gained tens of thousands of readers for the crisis, the NAACP's magazine, which he edited and frequently contributed to. Like Stoddard, he had a PhD in history from Harvard. He wrote, uh, excuse me, he wore a modest mustache, stood barely five feet six, and smoked Benson and Hedges cigarettes. Despite being off, often on the road and under plenty of stress, he lived for 34 more years. Stoddard admitted to reading Du Bois's books and once went so far as to say that he treasured them in his library. He seems to have been taking kind of negative inspiration from Du Bois. On the first page of The Souls of Black Folks, published in 1903, Du Bois wrote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. On page one of the French Revolution, in San Domingo, Stoddard wrote in 1914, the conflict of color bids fair to the fundamental problem of the 20th century. In the rising tide of color, he cites Du Bois to the effect that the colored peoples of the world are getting tired of white domination and will soon rise up. Okay, so that's another issue today this is the reason why black people does do not want to be associated with colored we're not people of color and colored people because that lumps us into everything you know and that's that's just way too much you know you know every group has their own thing okay the chicago debate happened in this way about a year and a half earlier the magazine the forum had asked stoddard and Alan Leroy Locke, the black writer, philosopher, and founding figure of the Holland Renaissance to write on the subject, we shall give the Negro cultural equality. The magazine also asked the two to read their pieces live on the radio, but then Locke recovering from an unhappy affair with Langston Hughes, that's interesting, uh, went to Europe and by September 23rd, 1927, the day of the broadcast, he had not returned. Du Bois agreed to fill in. What he said on air, elaborating on what Locke had written, must have been good because the forum's editor told him that the debate was a corker. And the consensus was that Du Bois had won. The forum council organizers then suggested holding the debate again before a paying crowd. So the debate must have been so good and uh, they wanted to take this show on the road. Stoddard ha had to have known that the audiences would be mostly black. Home field advantage would be to Du Bois. Why did Stoddard agree? Like any author with books to sell, he probably thought he could use the publicity. He had two new ones, The Story of Youth and Luck, Your Silent Partner. Also, Stoddard probably believed that he could overawe any audience of Blacks. He had, been, he had denied being a member of the Ku Klux Klan, but endorsed its tactics passionately in his books. And in 1926, he gave a lecture before 2,000 
at Tuskegee University in Alabama, informing them that the Nordic race was superior, non-whites, and that for the good of all races, the world must continue to be governed by white supremacy. <laughs> A black newspaper reported that the students sat awe-stricken during the address, which terminated without any applause. Du Bois, a realist, wondered if Stoddard would show up. In the letters to Fred Atkins Moore, the director of the Forum Council, Du Bois asked if they should line up an alternate. This man ain't going to show up. <laughs> he, <laughs> he suggested inviting an egregiously racist senator like James Thomas, Thomas Heflin of Alabama. He would be a scream. And you would clean up if you can get a hold of him. But Stoddard made positive noises about his plans to be there. He and Du Bois agreed in advance on the topic. It was decided that Du Bois would speak first. Tickets for the debate sold for 50 or 75 cents. The crowd number 5,000, 4,000, or 3,000, according to different counts. Du Bois, in a letter, to his wife, Nina, said that hundreds could not get in. The Chicago Defender, the leading black newspaper, ran a photo that showed a packed hall, floor seating, and a wraparound balcony with an American flag draped stage. It was a great occasion. Du Bois wrote to Nina. So Moore opened the program by telling the audience that the Forum Council itself takes no stand on any questions whatsoever. That is, the question of whether Blacks people were inferior to whites and therefore not entitled to full equality remained open. Moore himself was white. He asked the audience to refrain from applause. Then he introduced the boys, one of the ablest speakers for his race, not only in America, but in the world. The whole wide world, said Stoddard, whose books and writings and speaking have made his views known to many hundreds of thousands of people, both in this country and abroad. Du Bois must have been something else. Du Bois steps to the lectern. He begins by asking, what exactly Negroes are? Wow, that's interesting. Boy steps to the lecture and he begins by asking, what exactly Negroes are? What culturally, what cultural equality is? And how anyone can be encouraged to seek it? He asks, why Negroes or anybody else should not be encouraged to seek cultural equality? He allows that maybe in the past Negroes couldn't have reached it, but since emancipation, they have come wonderfully far. An accomplishment that has few parallels in human history. So that's very positive that Du Bois is talking about at that time from his view of how far Black people had come since slavery. For this, so yeah, for this, they had expected to be applauded, he says, but instead, white America feared them and said their advance threatened civilization, as if culture was some fixed quantity, and Negroes having more of it would mean less of it for others. Du Bois points out, that such a view imagines culture as if it were material goods, the best of which belong to only the few who have leisure to enjoy them. Then these people began to see the universe as made specially for them and elect themselves as the chosen people. And then they think that if the darker races become come forward, they are going to spoil the divine gifts of the Nordics. But there is no scientific proof 
that modern culture came from Nordics or that Nordics brains are better. In fact, Du Bois says the proofs of essential human equality of gift are overwhelming. He says that if Nordics believes themselves to be superior and do not want to mingle their blood with that of other races, who is forcing them? They can keep them themselves if they wish. He begins to thunder. But this has never been the Nordic program. Their program is subjection and rulership of the world for the benefit of the Nordics. They, they have overrun the earth and brought not simply modern civilization and technique, but with it exploitation, slavery, and degradation to the majority of men. They have been responsible for more intermixture of races than any other people, ancient and modern, and they have inflicted this miscegenation on helpless, unwilling slaves by force, fraud, and insult. And this is the folk that today has the impudence to turn on the darker races when they demand a share of civilization and cry, you shall not marry our daughters. The blunt crude reply is, who in the hell asked to marry your daughters? <laughs> du Bois was getting them. Du Bois says that what black, brown, and yellow people, nah, he's speaking for everybody, but whatever. Du Bois says what black, brown, and yellow people do want is to have the barriers to equal citizenship torn down. The demand is so reasonable and logical that to deny it is, sim is not simply to hurt and hinder them, it is to fly in the face of your own white civilization. He scores the senselessness of the racial categories in which a mixed person of race like him, a person of mixed race like himself, could and could and easily be considered a Nordic as a Negro. The hypocrisy gets worse. He says. When America, a great white nation with a magnificent plan of salvation, tosses out Christian behavior in dealing with, a, with ra issues of race, the attack that white people themselves have made upon their own moral structure are worse for civilization than anything that anybody of Negroes could ever do. So he was getting torn up. Then he asked the world of white supremacy a practical question. If it really intends to keep other races in subjection, can it? The white exploiters can't even get along among themselves, as was demonstrated by the recent war. So I guess that's World War I, which was a matter of jealousy in the division of the spoils of the Asiatic Asia and Africa, and by it, you nearly ruined civilization. So then Stoddard goes next. Now, what are he going to do? Having been praised by the moderator for his courage in appearing in a venue where Du Bois has so many supporters, Stoddard begins, nothing is more unfortunate than delusion. The Negro has been victim of delusion ever since the Civil War. He does not warn the audience against being swept away by his mulatto opponent, nor does he say, as he has already written elsewhere, that white Americas would rather see themselves and their children dead than mix with black people. <laughs> That's interesting. I didn't. That didn't age good, did it? Du Bois is surprised by the weakness of his performance and later attributes it to Stoddard's being too cautious to state frankly what he believes. Stoddard outlines a solution which he calls biracialism. So if you're calling yourself biracial, there you go. Thank your uh, Lothrop Stoddard. He calls it biracialism, a separate but equal setup which he says will be based on any will not be based on any inherent inferiority, but merely on racial difference. 
He says that white people don't want to mix with Asians either, although they don't find Asians inferior, just different. He uses the famous metaphor of the hand, first proposed by Booker T. Washington, that in all things purely social, the races can be separate as fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. The defining moment of the debate occurs as Stoddard describes how biracialism will provide each race with its own public sphere. The Forum Council later point, uh, printed the debate in a small book which records the moment. Stoddard says, the more enlightening men, the more enlightened men of Southern white America are doing their best to see that separation shall not mean discrimination, that if Negroes have separate schools, they shall be good schools, that if they have separate train accommodations, they shall have good accommodations, laughter. <laughs> so once he said that, everybody started laughing. There is just that one bracketed word, laughter, the transcription is being polite. Blacks who had moved to Chicago from the South knew the Jim Crow cars. The absurd, no, absurd notion that Jim Crow cars were anything except horrible, dirty, crowded, inconvenient, and degrading got a huge laugh. As the reporter for the Baltimore Afro-American put it, a good nature burst of laughter, laughter from all parts of the hall interrupted Mr. Stoddard when in explaining his biracial theory and attempting to show that it did not mean discrimination, said that under such a system, there would be the same kind of schools for Negro, but separate, the same kind of railroad coaches, but separate. When the laughter had subsided, Mr. Stoddard in a manner of mixed humility and courage claimed that he could not see the joke. This brought more laughter, more gales of laughter. So, you know, this is a, you know, this is a, I'm not going to read too much more on this here. I just wanted to kind of highlight this debate. You know, I think it would be important and, and uh, beneficial for us to check out uh, the Crisis Magazine to get into that history so that, uh, you know, we're really strong. We need to understand, you know, what was done before us. You know, that was in March. I think that was in March uh, 1929. So I think that would be interesting to check out, you know, the Crisis Magazine, which uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, he documented all sorts of um, historical events. All sorts of historical events. Uh, he documented because he lived a long life in black, the black st story. So W.B. Du Bois is literally a treasure trove of, of, of black history, of black first eye view of history because he was a writer. So he wrote it in detail. Uh, these are documents. You know, these are very important things, documents. And uh, this stuff is important to us because this is our mind. So, you know what? I think I want to let me I'll look at April because I think the debate happened in March. So I would end up. You look at this, you know, if you look at this magazine, this is what the black people had. You know, we had something. You got to realize that it wasn't all about slavery and Jim Crow and just getting your butt beat all over the place. You know, black people were doing things to try to develop ourselves to make to develop our self-esteem you know southern aid society this is awesome you know and and you know we're blessed to be able to get this because people will lie to you about your own history victory life insurance this is a black life insurance company you know southern aid society of virginia hmm interesting Black people were insuring each other, helping each other, businesses. Wow, 70,000 is still needed by Yankin University. So black, wow, look at this. 
Walter White's new book, Rope and Faggot. Now, I actually seen, oh, you know what? This was actually quoted in, um, this book was quoted in Message to the Black Man by the Elijah, Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I read that when on my video, Nation. So I was looking for this book, but I couldn't find it. But mm, this is interesting. So, yeah, like I said, uh, these are some stuff that black people, we need to make sure that we teach ourselves, teach our children and make sure that we understand, you know, these sorts of events in history. And that's it. Peace out, guys.